Before we get started, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We humbly present ourselves in the condition that you find us. We've got issues in our mind and in our heart and in our lives and with our friends and with our relatives and with our enemies, with our jobs and in our neighborhoods. Lord, you know all of it. We just want to leave it at your feet right now. And we want to release it so that you can activate and you can have your way. I pray for us here in this moment that you might speak to each heart the way that only you can to give us what we need. That as your people, as your children, as your sheep, that you would feed us and you would help us to know something more of you and something more of how we can please you in this life. So Lord, here we are. We know that you're here. We know that you love us. I pray that you help us to respond in a worshipful fashion as we learn in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to get back into Genesis today. Boy, a lot of really cultural weird things going on here. Like polygamy, for instance, sharing a husband. Not something I would advise, <laughs> but pastor, it's in the Bible. That's true. It doesn't mean you should do it. Judas hanged himself too. It doesn't mean you should do it. Peter denied Jesus three times. It doesn't mean you should do it. Just so that you know, in case you're looking for a little ammo and say, well, Pastor Dave read it from the Bible and, you know. Sharing a husband is a very interesting thing. It's, diff it's difficult enough to have one relationship. But as we saw, Jacob gets involved and actually now has four wives. Need I say any more? No, and I won't because I will be in danger. So one is enough. One is the way God planned it. All the way back in Genesis, he created one of each. And that's what he meant. And what happened was God is trying to teach this master deceiver who is Jacob not to do that anymore and to value the truth. And so we've been walking through this life from Abraham just to go over some of the things that we've previously gone over. We looked at stealing God's favor in chapter 27 when Jacob stole the blessing essentially from Esau, used food, which he knew was a weakness for him, and basically stole it from him. And then he went and deceived his blind father into thinking that he was blessing Esau. We saw that the way that he received it and the way the father gave it to him is because he was clothed in the clothes of the elder favored brother. Even as that's how we get favor, by the way, because we're clothed in Jesus Christ, the elder, older, favored brother. We saw him run away. He was in trouble. His mom, Rachel, who set this, uh, the, Rebecca, who set this whole thing up, said, you got to get out of here. Your brother's going to kill you. On the day that, you're, that my husband dies, he's going to kill you, and I'll have to mourn the two of you. And I don't want to do that. But I don't want you sticking around either because I don't want you to marry any of the local girls. And so she sends him away to Haran and says, you've got to go see my, my brother Laban and marry somebody from over there. They're a better stock of human being. And then we're really surprised to find out that that's not the case. So he goes and he meets Laban. And of course, Laban has intentions. We know that he's a materialist. We've seen him previously in chapter 25 of Genesis when he ran into and gave away Rebekah. And so he's known for being, uh, I don't know how to put it nicely, greedy for money. The guy is a materialist. 
And so we saw that he made him work seven years for Rachel, which is the woman he fell in love with. And he says, I want to marry Rachel. And he goes, well, what are you willing to pay for? Her? He goes, I'll give you seven years of my life. That was the going rate back then. And so he did. He gave seven years of his life and hard labor. Um, it sounds like prison. And it says that it seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. And then on his wedding night, Laban sneaks in Leah, who's the less attractive one, according to the scriptures. And he wakes up and he's with a woman he doesn't know. I won't ask for a show of hands. I remember getting, the day I got married, my wife did something so bizarre to her hair, I didn't recognize her. And I'm standing up front, you know, with the ring and, and memorized all the words I'm supposed to say, and I'm nervous. And she comes to come down the aisle, and I'm like, who is that? <laughs> she was supposed to get, I, she, what do you want me to do? Just do something, you know, nice. And she got into the hands of some crazy hairdresser. And they gave her like some kind of crazy bubble do from the 50s. And I was like, what am I doing? Who is this person? And I can only imagine that was Jacob's reaction when he woke up. And, you know, good morning, dear. What? And he realized he's been railroaded. He goes and talks to Laban about it and... He says, well, it's not our custom to marry off the younger before the elder. And the same thing that he did to his father by trying to steal the blessing as the younger over the elder gets done to him. And he suddenly learns the value of the firstborn and honoring that within a culture. He also understands that being false is a really terrible thing to do, especially when it's done to you. So there are some lessons that God teaches us and he kind of burns them out of us when we find ourselves in a situation where we get burned. Understand that the Lord may be trying to work something out of your life. Amen. At least I know it's happened to me. And it's very interesting as he goes through his life with these two women because you know you're gonna have a favorite. Don't have favorites. Don't have multiples. Just have one and you'll miss that. It's also difficult when you show favoritism in your family to certain children. We're going to see that coming up because what parents practice and do to moderation, children tend to do to excess because children learn from their parents by example, not necessarily by word. And so we're going to see that carried out throughout the family line. We saw that in succession, Leah, who was the unwanted one, after he has both of them, she's the one who's cranking out babies. She has four sons. And by the way, in this culture, a son is highly valued. They're the ones who inherit. In fact, before you have a son or before you're about to give birth, everybody gathers at the house. They get ready. They have partiers. They have, you know, all the instruments are gathered and the food's all laid out. And the announcement comes, it's a boy. And they all go, Happy New Year. And they have a blessed, wonderful time because it's a boy. When it's a girl, they're like, oh, Congratulations, let's all go home. And everyone goes home, and, it, and it's a rather disappointing thing to be a woman in this culture. Of course, that's not the way it is anymore, right guys? You better not be that way, that's right. She has a first son and names him Reuben, which is, look what I did, behold a son. And it says, God will end my torture now, and my husband will love me, which tells you something of her motivation. Here's Leah who's unloved and she knows she's unloved. She's been competing with her sister all her life and she gets pawned off on this guy and she knows that she's unloved. And so what does she do to try to be loved? Have, have babies. Now my husband, look, I've produced a son. He's got to love me now. And then that wasn't enough. Produced a second son, Simeon, which means I'm now heard. This is, this is something that God gave to me because he finally hears my cries that I'm unloved. And so he's given me a son. So I'm gonna name him Heard because God heard me and gave me another son. And boy, he's gonna love me now. And then has a third son, names him Levi, which means joined. And she's still hoping it's going to join her and her husband together by having children. 
And of course, that never does it, does it? Because children don't necessarily bring people together if they don't want to be together. My goodness, there are enough single parent families that could tell you that. Just because they had a baby with somebody doesn't mean there's intimacy. It doesn't mean that there's one mindedness. It doesn't mean anything. It just means you produce the child and now for the rest of your life, you're gonna have to go back and forth with custody and all that kind of bananas. So Levi joined. This has gotta be it. The Lord's gonna take care of things. And then she finally has a fourth child, which is named Judah. Judah means praise. And she's at the point where she's able to say, praise the Lord. And she names him praise. And we know Judah becomes the line in which Jesus Christ comes through, King David and Solomon and all of that. That's a blessed line, but we see it starts out well with a good name, Judah, meaning praise. So she's actually come to the place where she's praising God just for who God is, for what God's done, not necessarily because now I have a child, my husband will love me. It's not attached necessarily to her husband. And that's not wrong. It's right to have God as first in your heart, not your husband, not your wife. Amen? Amen. And certainly not your children, because they will leave you. If you do a good job, they will. The deepest yearning in the heart of a woman is the security of being deeply loved. This is the lesson that I learned from, from this. And when received, it results in praise. Right. Gentlemen, know that the deepest need of your wife is security through love. You got to know that. Most men have no idea. Hey, what's your wife's greatest need? Amazon? <laughs> they don't know. They don't know. You ask a woman, what's, what's, your, what's your husband's greatest need? A motorcycle? You know, they don't know. They have no idea. The greatest thing for a man is honor, respect. They live on honor and respect. It's like fuel. It's like gasoline in your engine. Oh, maybe not for you, but anyway. This week, sharing a husband. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we're going to look at more of the drama within this dysfunctional family. It sounds like a commercial for a soap opera. Just wanted to share a, a passage with you before we begin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 29, it says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise, according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in this world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in this world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing those things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. No, as we go through here and we look at all the foibles and frailties and shortcomings of these folks, that it's just like you and me. We're made of the same stuff. They're no greater and they're no lesser than you and I, made of the same stuff. And God delights in taking broken things and making them whole, Amen. in things that are twisted and making them straight. And that's all of us. So before we get in, I figured I'd remind you of that. This is all within God's intention. Now, verse one, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, now this is the favored, the more loved wife, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. I bet she said it just like that. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? We get a little bit of a domestic scuffle here that's now written in the Bible for us to look at and we get to take it apart. Have, have any of you ever had an argument with your spouse? <laughs> the rest of you are liars. <laughs> Two becoming one flesh is never an easy thing. Never, because it means half of you dies. It's just the nature of it. Whenever I read Fruit of the Womb, I think of underwear. I don't know why. I didn't put it up there. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm twisted, okay? If you get anything out of this, it's because God is good. 
Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children. Now, this is the favored wife. And she says, give me children or I die. Well, she's really talking to the wrong person, isn't she? It's not like he's not trying. And he just had four through her sister. It, it, he's, it, he's, it, he's okay. He's, he's vital. He's virile. It's happening. There's no chastising him for not trying. And, you know, she's the more loved wife. And so, you know, it's not that he's not making his rounds. And typically, when you have multiple wives, you have a schedule. And you bounce around from apartment to apartment because they have separate tents, by the way. They're not all living in a communal setting. Give me children or I die. You're really talking to the wrong guy. And it might have been better if Jacob said that instead of getting angry and saying, why are you blaming me? Sometimes we snap. The other thing is, you got a wrong tone. I don't like your tone. It's got a bad tone. Her tone is, it's all your fault. It's all your fault. You ever do that? You ever talk to the wrong person in the wrong way? And explode on them like it's their fault? Like something's their fault? It's better to do some digging and tell the Lord about it. Dump those things at the feet of the Lord. The Lord will help you sort that stuff out and figure what's of you, what's of him, what's of them, and how to go about it and how to deal with it. I understand she's just expressing her frustration. You guys know that, right? But it comes out as an accusation. And because it comes out like she's trying to blame him, he gets angry, he gets triggered, and he snaps on her. It's like, it's not my fault. What do you think the innuendo is there? It ain't me. She's already feeling bad. I'm not sure telling her it's her fault would ever help. But that's what it comes down to when we react emotionally like that. So Leah has unrequited love. So she's not getting any love back from her husband, even though she's got plenty of children. Rachel has unrealized expectations. She's hoping to have children like her sister, but her sister's having all the children. And it's interesting, we see God's motivation in opening her womb is because she wasn't loved. God tried to fill her in some respect because she was the unloved wife. And God blessed her in that way because she couldn't be blessed in the other way. And we see Rachel is just gets these expectations that are just unrealistic and she doesn't have them. Both these women are yearning for something they don't have. Both these women are hurting and empty. And the thing is, he is not going to be the one to solve their problems. It's going to be the Lord himself. Amen? Amen. Just thought I'd show you that little bit of marital counseling here this morning. In Proverbs 13, 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. If you know what it's like to have to wait for a long period for something, uh, or if you've stepped on the scale every morning and watched it slowly go down as you make what you believe is great sacrifices, morning, noon, and night for months. I'm sorry, I'm not talking to you anymore. Um, <laughs> talking about myself. Deferred, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when it comes, it's like a tree of life. You guys know what that's like, right? This long-awaited thing that you've kind of progressively gone through, it's, it's a blessing when it finally comes. So, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 10, is really a good example for us, and I think would be the cure for this situation. It says here in verse 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness means God has me in this place for this time, this way, for a reason. And I need to figure out what that is and rest in the fact that God is superior, overarching, and sovereign in every way. And if he wanted to change my situation, he would. He, he could do it with a whisper. Contentment is realizing that wherever it is that I am and whatever's come my way has come either by God's causing it or God allowing it. And so I'm going to be content in that situation. 
and then I don't get worried and I don't freak out and I don't do crazy things because I realize that God's going to see us through it. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Wow, doesn't say air conditioning, doesn't say a soft seat on Sunday, doesn't say any of that. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Any of you who ever bought something that was way more expensive than you can afford, you know what that's like. You know what it is to get into something and desire something and pull the trigger and make it happen, and then you get hit with a monthly payment and you go, holy mackerel, what was I thinking? You can pierce yourself through with a lot of t trouble, desiring things that you really shouldn't have or gaining things that you can't hold on to. Uh, next slide. And so she said, here is my maid Bilha, go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. And she gave him Bilha her maid, as wife, and Jacob went into her. Bilhah means troubled. I'm sure she's troubled. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm happy to be your maid, but this, is a little, this wasn't in the contract. Now, if you know anything about the, the code of Hammurabi, uh, this guy Hammurabi was a big guy in, in the East. And... He set down these codes. This is 800 years before Moses. And there are all of these things. And one of those things that was set down in the law is you could actually do this and have a surrogate or have a replacement for a wife. And the wife would then give, or, or this woman would give birth and then the wife would take ownership of the child and raise the child. It's great. It's the law of the land. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. And so Bilha, I imagine, is thinking, you know, I know I should have gone to college. I shouldn't have taken this job as a maid because now I'm getting swindled into being a wife of a man that I don't love so that I can produce children for a woman that I work for. You have to appreciate that situation. You think your boss is tough. Verse 5, and Bilha conceived and bore Jacob a son. And then Rachel said, God has judged my case and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. You remember somebody else did this, right? Sarah with Hagar. Sarah said, well, listen, God said you're gonna have children, but it doesn't mean through me. Hey, here's my maid. She's from Egypt. That's great. Thanks. And you remember what the Lord said, take them both and send them away. I'll make a great nation out of them. There's gonna be 12 princes that come from him, but he's not the one, like I said. So we see that's not God's way. It might be society's way, but it's not God's way. So be careful. Just because society says something doesn't necessarily mean it's what the Lord would have for you. So Bilhah conceives to Dan and Rachel's all excited. Dan means judge. In other words, God has looked down and said, okay, enough of this. I'm going to give Rachel a child, but it's really not through Rachel. So you think that's going to fill that empty space? I'll tell you, I read ahead. No, it doesn't. His name's Dan or means judge. I've been awarded a settlement from God. I, I, brought, I brought my cry to God and then I kind of finagled something and now this is my settlement. You know, I've heard of people getting settlements in court, but never from God. That's what she thinks. Rachel's maid, Bilhah, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And then Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister. So this baby is really all about competition with her sister. Ew. Right? With great wrestlings, I've wrestled with my sister and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Naphtali means my wrestling. Imagine walking around with a name for the rest of your life 
because your mom had a problem with her sister. These are the people God chose to make the 12 tribes of Israel. He takes broken things and exalts himself in them anyway. My wrestling, Naphtali, look, I'm winning over my sister. I've got two, she's got four. She's keeping score on the wall, I'm sure. And then Leah saw that she had stopped bearing. So she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Two can play at this game. You got a handmaid, I got a handmaid, okay. Since apparently I can't have any more children because it's all stopped, I know what I'll do. I'll fight fire with fire, maid for maid. Not a good idea. I just wanted to help people in small ways. And, and now, I mean, can you imagine being a handmaid and then suddenly being thrown in as a wife into a family? I, you know, I just, you know, I wanted to be a maid and help people in, in small ways. Her name means dripping, uh, like, like a slow ebb. And I get the idea that uh, that's, that was probably her personality. She just, I just want to help in small ways. And now I'm, I have to marry this guy because my boss told me to. You got to feel for these women. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad. Gad means troop. She thought he was the beginning of a whole army of children that were going to come so that she could win this competition of childbearing. I'm, I'm astonished when I read these things. I will win with my reinforcements. So that's why she names him Troop or Gad. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, I am happy for the daughters will call me blessed. Why is she happy she had a baby? Because everybody else is going to call me a super mom. Is that a really good reason to have a child? No. Do you have any idea? Anyway, sorry. I am happy. For the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher, which means happy. So finally it's happy, but she's happy because all the women will talk about her and say, oh, what a super mom she is. Look, you know, she can fry up the bacon and, you know. <laughs> Other women will call me super mom, right? I had a baby. Good for me. Everyone's going to think I'm a super mom. Do you understand how when God gives us blessings in our lives, we can mistake it and think it's all about us. My goodness. We could get this way, couldn't we? Now, Reuben. You remember Reuben? Oldest, was born. He was first, first of Leah's kids. Now, he's a working young man. He works on the family farm. Now, Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and he found mandrakes in the field. And he brought them to his mother, Leah, and Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? <laughs> and Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. Now they're exchanging him like a commodity. What do I say about that? Well, you guys might not know what a mandrake is, unless you've seen Harry Potter and then you have a vision of what a mandrake is. Uh, a mandrake is a particular herb that grows in the field. It has long, dark green leaves. It gives off a purple flower and a yellow fruit. It's called a love apple. <laughs> you know what they use it for? An aphrodisiac. So why is she interested in this little fruit? Because she hasn't borne any children of her own. And she's desperate to the point that she's willing to give up her turn in line sleeping with her husband to the unloved one, the competitor. She's going to give her husband to the competitor because she wants these little love apples. By the way, this is what the root looks like. It's a little freaky. It looks like a person, doesn't it? Oh, but that's not all. They have these beautiful fragrant flowers that, that come up. 
and they have these wonderful little yellow apples, kind of like an upside down heart. That's what they look like. Um, because mandrakes contain, now I have to wait until it's finished. Some mandrakes contain a delirium, hallucinogenic tropane, alkaloids. And the shape of their roots often resembles a human figure. They have been associated with magic rituals throughout history, including present-day contemporary pagan traditions such as Wicca or Odinism. So they actually use these still today, taken over from these pagan practices, and they still think that this is the way to go. She tells her husband, hey, you're not with me tonight, the wife you really love. You're with Leah. <laughs> and he goes, okay. <laughs> Ew. Anyway, you're bought and paid for. Dude, you're, you're just a gigolo. <laughs> Accidental poisoning is not uncommon. Ingesting mandrake root is likely to have other adverse effects such as vomiting and diarrhea. The alkaloid concentration varies between plant samples, but clinical reports the effective consumption of Mediterranean mandrake, which is what we're talking about, includes severe symptoms uh, similar to those of atropine poisoning, including blurred vision, dilation of the pupils, uh, madrasis, dryness of the mouth, difficulty in urinating, dizziness, headache, vomiting, blushing, and rapid heart rate, or tachycardia. Hyperactivity hallucinations occurred in the majority of patients. It sounds like a commercial. <laughs> if you've got depression, try this medication. It may cause suicide, but try it anyway. Have trouble paying for it? Call us at this number. I, it amazes me that they do that. And this was thought to be an aphrodisiac, that it would not only be a sexually inspiring thing, but that it would cause you to bear children. Any old herb will do probably better than this. But by the way, that's a real root. Uh, that's not something that's been animated. That's a real root. That's a real, and they look like little human beings. It's, uh, it's the weirdest thing. So you can see, and it actually grows hair on it, which gets pretty freaky. It says the root is, high, is hallucinogenic and narcotic. In sufficient quantities, it induces a state of unconsciousness and was used as an aesthetic uh, anesthesia anesthetic for surgery in ancient times. In the past, juice from this finely grated root was applied externally to relieve rheumatic pains or arthritis. It was used internally to treat melancholy convulsions and mania. When taken internally in large doses, it is said to excite delirium and madness. <laughs> Gotta get me some of that mandrake. <laughs> In the past, mandrake was often made into amulets, which were believed to bring good fortune, cure sterility, etc. In one superstition, people who pull up this root will be condemned to hell, and the mandrake root will scream and cry as if it were pulled from the ground, killing anyone who heard it. By the way, that's a true folklore that's been handed down. Therefore, in the past, people who have tied roots to the bodies of animals and then used these animals to pull the roots from the soil. This folklore reference is integrated into part of a portrayal in the fictional mandrake described in Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets. So it's funny, art actually imitates real life. So this folklore actually is, it's truly been passed down and it was picked up for Harry Potter about the mandrakes, that they would scream once they're pulled up and anyone hearing that scream would die and go straight to hell. That's how parents keep the kids from messing with the mandrakes. That's, I, listen, you, you see that fruit? The day you eat of it, you'll surely die. Okay, make sure you tell your wife. All right, you tell your wife and you say, you see that fruit? Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. And the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. What you do is you add stuff onto it so people don't mess around. They, they stay away. But that backfires, doesn't it? Yes, they don't scream, and you won't go straight to hell if you pull it up, but don't mess with it. It's mentioned one other place in the scriptures, in Song of Songs, so brace yourselves. Let us get up early in the vineyards. Let us see the vine has budded, whether the grape blossoms are open and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. 
The mandrakes, next word, give off a fragrance, and at our gates are pleasant fruits, all manner new and old, which I have laid up for you, my beloved. A little poetry in the middle of Sundays. Always a good reset. That's before we move on. There are some people that believe because the, the word is dudai, the original word, which actually is a word for, it could be opium. Just figured I'd let you know there are some scholars that debate as to whether it was mandrake or opium, which has never brought any good as far as I know outside of the hospital setting. Then Jacob came out of the field in the evening and Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night and God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages. Wow. Because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. Issachar means there is recompense. In other words, I've been paid back. Payback is the price of produce. I've been given a son for my son's mandrakes. Wow. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me. Apparently he has cut her off at this point and has to be finagled to, to be with her. Now I have borne him six sons. And so she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her Dinah. So Zebulun means exalted dwelling. He, now my husband will live with me because I gave him six sons. I will be exalted and he will dwell with me. It's still about, I just don't have enough. I'm not good enough and I'm not loved, isn't it? I'll finally get my husband to live with me. I, I've given him six sons. So live in large with a half dozen. Six of the 12 tribes are given by, through Leah, who was the one he didn't bargain for. And it says, afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. And that's it. There's no more explanation. There's no uh, blessing. Dinah means judgment. So I have no idea what to say about that. I have these sons and there's this big proclamation and this, my husband's going to love me and he's going to live with me now. And she has a daughter and she names her judgment. And tell all the instrument people and the party people and the caterers go home. It's a daughter. Dinah, judgment. The willful mandrake caper backfired on Rachel times three. She says, I got to get that mandrake. She takes the mandrake. You can go sleep with my husband. What's, what ends up happening? She has two more children. Her competitor has two more children. Sad, sad story. I mean, keeping up with the Joneses is kind of an interesting term. Don't, don't do it. And God remembered Rachel. And the crowd went wild. <laughs> God remembered Rachel. Now listen, it's been a long time and everybody seems to be having children but her. God remembered Rachel. And God listened to her, which means she had to speak to him. It's about time she did, right? Give me children or I die. No, no, no. Talk to God about it. And God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add me another son. So you just gave birth to a son and it's good and God heard you and you're grateful. And yet that's not enough. I'm going to have another one. Can't you be happy with the son you have? But it's actually a prophecy because there is another son that she has. His name's Benjamin. And it takes a while before that happens, before God opens her womb again. Then Benjamin becomes the youngest one and she dies in childbirth. So the thing that she said, give me children or I die, is kind of a haunting reminder as she passes away with the birth of um, Benjamin later. 
But that's not all. Not just going to have juice, uh, Joseph, we're going to have another one. Just to remind you what the scripture says otherwise about reproduction and children, in Psalm 127, 1 to 5, it says, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. And so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. There's this promise that all of this comes from God. And if you're going to try to manufacture something that God doesn't want to happen, if you're going to stay up late and you're going to rise up early to try to defend a city and God's not defending that city, it's for no reason. God is the one who does anything. doesn't mean we don't have any part to play in it. But be careful that you don't try to manufacture something that God doesn't want because you'll end up with a dysfunctional family like Jacob. Psalm 139, if you remember David talking about the wonder of being created by God. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they were written, the days fashioned for me, when yet there were none of them. This is God's intimate involvement in the creation of human beings at the point of conception and before, because God knew everything about us before we were ever born. Everything that we would do, every place our foot would go, has been ordained by God and written in his book before one of them ever was. That's why we don't believe in abortion, because God is instrumental in this life. So those of you who are keeping score and keeping an idea, I gave you a little family tree here. You've got Leah, who has Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Those are the first five children. Getting tired, Rachel says, here, have, my, have Bilhah, Rachel's slave, and she produces Dan and Naphtali. Then it bounces back, and then there's Issachar and Zebulun through Leah, and then there's Zilpah has, I'm sorry, no, seven and eight is Gad and Asher, and then nine and 10 is this car and, and Zebulun and then Dinah, which she's not really in the running, but there she is. And then you have Joseph on the far right and Benjamin. Uh, Joseph gives birth to um, Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, marrying a Gentile bride in Egypt and giving birth to them. And they get added to uh, the 12 tribes. And so it's a little bit confusing when you look at all the listings of the tribes. When we get there, I'll explain it to you. But this is Judah, you see, comes down through King David Solomon and then all the kings of Judah and then Jesus ultimately comes from the line of Judah. And so you're gonna see lots of prophecies in the scripture about Judah and the scepter not leaving Judah and all of it. And verse 25, and it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country. You see, he's worked for this guy for 14 years. He's got his own family. I, I want to get out of this arrangement now, please. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go. For you know my service, which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, please stay. If I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. And then he said, give me your wages and I will give it. You go to your boss and you say, listen, I quit. And he goes, no, 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 no. Tell me what you need to stay. No, I want to get out of here. I'm done. Oh, how much do you need? You're not listening. I'm leaving. Bye-bye. See you later. Let me go. Oh, come on. You've, God's blessed me because you're here and I appreciate you and you're so important. And you know, a con man really knows how to find your vulnerability. And so he begins to poke and prod at, at Jacob and he appeals to, now listen, he has no faith in God, by the way. He's an idol worshiper. But he realizes that God blesses him because Jacob's around. Jacob is not the, the mild man who lives in tents anymore. He's a worker. He's worked for 14 years for these two wives. 
not to mention the suffering of having four wives and having to have children with them being bounced around and treated like a product. I got to get out of here because Laban, you're just a little too much for me. My plate's pretty full. I want out. And he goes, oh, come on. You're kidding me. I, you know, I've been good to you. You've been good to me. And it doesn't say through experience, actually, in the original scripture. It says, I have come to find through divination that God has blessed me. And the same word for divination in the scripture is actually serpent. So it goes all the way back. Anyway, so he's not saying, I believe in the God of, of, of your fathers and of you. He's saying, I just realized I got it made when you're around because you work really hard and I'm getting rich off you. So please don't leave me. That's really what the pitch is. And you got two con artists having a conversation. It's the battle of the cons. And they're, they're trying to, you know, he's trying to wiggle out and he's trying to t tie him down. I'm going to go quickly. So Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your livestock has been with me. For what had before I came was little and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. So he's affirming that. And now you shall, I, and now when shall I also provide for my own house? Because I'm working for somebody else. I'd like to have my own business, please. So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. You see, words are important. Laban says, what do you want me to give you? I don't want you to give me anything. I'm working for this, pal. It's like, here, here's your paycheck that I so graciously give to you. No, no, I earned that thing. <laughs> I came in early, I left late. You know, I, I worked for that thing. Don't tell me you're giving me anything. Words are important, aren't they? Because the con's trying to con a con, which you can't con a con shall not give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. So he says, I will stay under this arrangement. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats. And these shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats or brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. And Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word, because he knows Mendelssohn's law that that is a recessive trait in cattle. And cattle, by the way, refers to lambs, goats, any kind of animal. It's a recessive trait because usually the ones, you have white sheep, you have black um, goats. They're usually a single color. And those are the attractive ones that people want. You know, they make a jacket out or a leather coat, you know. Those are desirable. But the ones with the speckles, it's like not so much. So he says, let me go through and get the speckled ones out, which is a, a very small bit. It's like blue eyes and green eyes, you know, they're recessive. Okay, you don't want to get into this with me. And so, so Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word. Now, I want you to catch this. So he, by the way, that means Laban, removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it and all the brown ones among the lambs and gave them into the hand of his sons. And he put three days journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. You see what he said was, what I want for payment is all the speckled and you know all the mixed colored ones. He said, no problem. Let me make sure I take all the speckled ones out first and I give them to my son and I send him away three days away so we don't confuse the arrangement and you can start fresh with my flock of all single colors. He got him. So what are you going to do? Now you have to care for the crop of, of these animals and hope that one of them spits out a speckled one or a striped one. And then that's the one you have to work with and work your way up. So he's starting from zero. Working for a con artist is no fun. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them, and expose the white which is in the rods. 
and the rods which he peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters, actually where they water themselves, in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and he had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. <laughs> this concludes our reading here in Genesis. <laughs> How did Rachel think she was going to get pregnant? An aphrodisiac. How did he think he was going to prosper? By peeling some sticks and putting them in the water. We don't learn until chapter 31, God spoke to him and told him what to do. He told him when you go to before Laban, ask for the speckled and striped ones. And the Lord said, I will bless you. You remember he met with him when he was at Bethel and he says, I will bless you. God's gonna bless him. But this boy's working for it too, isn't he? So here's the, here's the reason, if you will. There are some people, scientists, that say that the power of suggestion when copulating is something that will produce a child. Like you can wish yourself a male or a female. You can wish yourself a speckled or a solid animal. There are some people that actually believe that. And he's taking these things and he's putting them in the water. Here's the other theory. The theory is it makes the water really, really sweet and so it causes the animals to get in there and drink. And when the female animals are in there drinking, they're standing still. And so they become a target for the men. <laughs> the third theory is God blessed him. Amen. I think the third theory is exactly right. God blessed him. But there was some stuff that he did. And I think he was playing tricks on the sheep. I think he had these guys feet over here and these guys feet over here and all the speckled and striped ones. He was taking care of extra special and making sure that they would meet with each other in an intimate fashion and reproduce. And we know that speckled and spotted and speckled and spotted bring about more speckled and spotted. Every once in a while, you might have a, a solid sheep, but then what he does is he puts that one aside so it doesn't mix with the others. You don't have solid sheeps and speckled sheeps mating with each other. Just speckled with speckled, solid with solid, but he takes care of the speckled ones really well. And his business is rising, and Laban's animals are getting feeble. What do you think Laban the con artist is going to do? Oh, he's not going to institute profit sharing, I can tell you that. So, that's the countermeasure. I want to remind you that, to remind you of your calling, brothers, that not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, not many of you were powerful, not many of you were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in this world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing those things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. That is what is happening in this story because there's no hero in this story but God. He's the one who's making things happen regardless of their frailties, their foibles, their family dysfunction. God is at work and God will do the same for you that he did for him. Don't think that you're so broken, you're so twisted, you're so messed up that God can't use you. It's that very quality by which he chooses you. Amen.